In the aftermath of World War II, the world was in a bit of a rough state. Weapons of mass destruction on a scale humans had never seen had been built and used. Europe was ravaged and in ruins. Africa had seen an incredibly brutal campaign to liberate it. Asia had been a place of some of the most horrifying human rights violations in history. And the Pacific Ocean was filled with spent shells, crashed planes, and sunken ships. And more wars seemed to be about to break out, and some ultimately did. And a lot of things had gone missing, such as artwork still lost to this day, and even dangerous things as well, also some of which is still missing. Yet, despite it being a bad time, the World War was over. The deadliest conflict in human history was past, and there was finally peace again in most of the world comparatively. The world worked to get things back on track, and soon people saw everywhere recovering as the 1940s continued. Then one day, in the Dutch Indies, only a few years after the end of the war, there was an encounter with a strange ship that sounds like it came straight out of a horror story. I've talked about ghost ships before. I mentioned, I mentioned it in the intro, but I made a video about a ghost ship that killed one-third of Norway's population because of what it brought to the country. But nonetheless, to me, this is the most terrifying ghost ship story in history, and I'm going to tell it to you. The ship was first mentioned in newspapers in the late 1940s, accompanied by pictures. Depending on the source you look at, you'll probably find a different date for this event. They kind of range across the 1940s, so we'll just put this having occurred in either 1947 or 1948, as these are generally considered the two most accurate dates. The ship in question, the Orang Madan, which means Man of Madan, was supposedly a Dutch merchant ship. A ship which sent out a very terrifying SOS and was later found adrift in the Straits of Malacca. On board was the scene straight out of a horror movie and the beginning of one of the most terrifying unsolved ocean mysteries ever. The sea keeps its secrets, and it likely will forever keep this one too. But we'll talk about what we know and what might be the full picture. The incident of the Orang Madan was recorded in a few official publications, including the Proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council, which is published by the United States Coast Guard. Now, with the setting established and a little idea of what was going on in the world at the same time, let's cover the story of the derelict Orang Madan. The story that is, in my opinion, the perfect embodiment of an ocean horror story. The SOS you heard at the beginning of the video was the beginning of this story. Supposedly, it was heard by multiple international listening stations, which is important because if it hadn't, then we likely wouldn't have the rest of this story. Just like the Titanic, if Phillips and Bride hadn't fixed the wireless set the day before the ship hit the iceberg, we probably wouldn't know what happened to the Titanic today. It would have just disappeared. But because they did, we know what happened. And ships were able to make a mad dash to save them. Anyway, you'll see why these international listening posts were important in just a second. The message itself apparently said the following, quote, SOS from Orang Madan. We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. Following this, there was an unintelligible mess of confused dots and dashes. A confused mess that made no sense. Then, two words came through clearly. I die. Freaky. So, the signal was determined to be coming from the Straits of Malacca. U.S. ships, the city of Baltimore and the Silver Star, were in the region, and picked up the message from the Orang Madan. They, among other ships also nearby, heard the messages and began trying to figure out what they should do. Eventually, the ship's location was determined with the help of the mentioned British and Dutch listening posts. This is why they were important. They triangulated the signal. Since it didn't offer a location, they could only find its source with other means. They triangulated it to a specific area, and the Silver Star was the one to investigate. The Silver Star crew felt it was their obligation to do so, especially since the message indicated the ship was, we'll just say, in a bad way. With the others standing by, they set off to find the Orang Madan. When they found it, it was a derelict, drifting with no smoke emerging from her smokestack. The Silver Star came alongside the Orang Madan, and multiple attempts to hail the crew were made, but none yielded any signs of life. 
the ship was silent and showed no signs of human activity. Eventually, the Silver Star crew felt they couldn't wait any longer due to the implied threat to human life, and they organized a search party to board the drifting vessel and look for the crew or anyone alive. And what they found on board is just as scary as what the people found on the ghost ship in my last video about this kind of thing. Here we go again. We once again have a situation where this ship was a ghost ship, and everyone on board was dead. Reportedly, they, the crew, died with expressions of terror on their face, like they were looking at something horrifying above them. Even the dog died in this way, like it was preparing to defend itself. The whole human crew looked the same. Dead bodies were sprawled on their backs across the deck, their frightened faces looking up at the sky and their mouths open in gaping terror. Inside the ship, the story was much the same. People on the bridge, in the chart room, in the halls, even the engine room. The crew died with expressions of terror on their faces, looking like they were trying to fight back against something. No one had any signs of injury, though the bodies were apparently decaying very fast. Unusually fast, even. I always imagined the interior of the Orang Madan was dark. Oh, we don't know either way, but that's how I always pictured it. Dark and claustrophobic. These pitch black, tight hallways dotted with the corpses of the crew, the Silver Star crew trying to flip light switches and power boxes to get the lights on. How accurate that image is, I don't know. Probably not very, since the crew supposedly was only around 23 people. There probably wasn't really anyone dead in the halls if the bodies were across the deck, in the chart room, and in the engine room. Though I can imagine the lights were probably off, but it would be just as creepy if they were still on. It was also reported that the inside of the ship was cold, and the engine room on an old ship like this should not be cold. The engine room is basically the beating heart of a steamship. If it goes cold, then the ship is dead in the water. The engine room on a freighter like this at the time should have been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Not chilly. Not cold. And it would take a very long time to get that way. Not just the few hours it had been since the SOS had been sent. So, after seeing all of this, the Silver Star crew decided that something really bad had gone down. Obviously, even the radio operator who sent the SOS was found dead, slumped over the set. Some say even his hand was still on the telegraph transmitter knob. The only person, apparently, who didn't die with an expression of fear on their face. Which is interesting to think. Why did this one person survive what happened? And how long were they alive? And how did they know they were going to die? How did they know whatever it was was coming for them? It's so scary to imagine being the last one on a ship with the dead crew all around you, knowing you're alone and apparently also knowing whatever killed them is coming for you too. I'm getting the chills as I record this. It's kind of like a situation where you hear the monster coming down the hallway. I'll cover some theories about what killed the crew in a bit, but for now, let's finish the story of the encounter itself. The Silver Star captain decided they would tow the ship in and let experts investigate the ship. After seeing everything on the freighter, they decided it was by far the best option. So the tow line was rigged and the vessels were attached to each other, and the Silver Star was ready to set off back for port when suddenly, the crew discovered there was smoke below decks, and they soon saw more billowing out of the interior of the ship. Within the number four cargo hold, a fire had broken out. Realizing the ship could not be saved, the Silver Star captain ordered his crew to abandon ship and return to their own vessel. The tow line was then cut once everyone was on board, and the Silver Star put distance between themselves and the Orang Madan. This action apparently came in the nick of time. The Silver Star crew watched as the Dutch freighter burned, and only minutes after they cut the line and put distance between them, it exploded, and the ship apparently was thrown out of the water for a moment from the force before splashing back down into the ocean and sinking rapidly. Moments later, the burning Orang Madan sank below the ocean. She took her whole deceased crew, cargo, and other secrets with her and was never seen again. There are a few theories about what happened here. First, some have suggested that the ship was carrying a cargo full of potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin, which got loose after being improperly stored in the cargo hold. Which, yes, 
That could explain both the fire and the powerful explosion. Another theory is that the ship had a bioweapon made by Unit 731 on board. If that is the case, it could explain why everyone died and why it would be covered up. Think about it. If extremely dangerous biological weapons were being transported around, would the government receiving them really want that information out there? Especially if the shipment was lost? I doubt it. Especially considering Unit 731 was experimenting with some, we'll just say, extremely lethal bioweapons in World War II. Put the biohazard symbol on screen, everyone. It's time to learn about nerve agents. Another Japanese-made weapon it is theorized the ship was carrying was some type of nerve agent, which I took a weapons of mass destruction course for my degree. Nerve agents are some scary shit, and this situation with the crew really could fit this being the cause of their deaths. So settle down, class. We are in session. Nerve agents, also known as nerve gas, are technically a type of chemical weapon. These chemicals are liquid at room temperature, and they were initially developed in secrecy by the German military before and during World War II, but Hitler never actually used them. These chemicals are extremely toxic and are classified as either a G-series or a V-series. A G-series nerve agent tends to volatize and dissipate quickly. And because these G-series nerve agents aren't considered to be persistent, which is one reason I think a G-series nerve agent could have been on the Orang Madan. If it had been a V-series, it probably would have killed the Silver Star crew too, because those tend to hang around for a while. By the way, after World War II, a lot of the nerve agents the Germans developed were just dumped in the ocean. Don't you love that? Now, now that you have basic information about nerve agents, let's talk about if one could have been responsible for the deaths of everyone on the Orang Madan. I'm not sure what nerve agent it would be if one was the cause for everyone dying. Looking at my college textbook over WMDs, which is Terrorism and WMDs, Awareness and Response by John Pitchell, it could have maybe been Tabin. It doesn't sound like Saren, or again, a V-series nerve agent. Tabin is extremely toxic, but the issue with it being Tabin is that it has a fruity odor, and no such odor was reported. I don't think it would have been Saren either, but Saren is odorless. Tabin was also developed by the Germans in World War II, not the Japanese, but I do think it's reasonable that they could have shared this kind of stuff between each other. Sarin was the same way, discovered by the Germans in the late 1930s while they were trying to develop a new pesticide. The only thing that doesn't really make sense with it is the way they died. Looking up at the sky like they were trying to fight something they were afraid of, which seemed to be above them. And you gotta wonder why the radio operator didn't die at the same time. If a nerve agent got loose and wiped everyone else, and wiped everyone out, why didn't it do it to him at the same time? I highly doubt he did die at the same time and it was a literal ghost sending that SOS. Anyway, the Japanese stored nerve agents in China during World War II. The theory goes that since if a US ship was to transport it, it would leave a paper trail. So they had someone else, a non-registered ship, transport it for them. Basically, a freighter who wouldn't ask questions, and they just wanted paid. Fair enough. And this could explain why it would be covered up when it killed everyone. Or just never acknowledged. Plausible deniability at its best. And I could even see the ship having a false name if it was being used for this purpose. And the radio operator using that name in the, in the distress call, because that's the name the ship was going by. Orang Madan might not be the real name of the ship in this case. And another reason it might have been covered up after going to hell, and the U.S. used a method that would leave no trail that goes back to them, is something that comes down to this point in time. Think about it. This was when the Cold War was just starting to get icy. I absolutely could see the U.S. wanting to use a method of transporting something like this that couldn't be traced back to them, especially, again, if it was a Japanese-made nerve agent being transported via ship. They wouldn't want the Soviet Union to learn about it. Food for thought. But, circling it all back around, the nerve agent theory is very appealing and answers a lot of questions about the mystery. What the specific agent could have been, 
the Japanese developed a lot of nasty stuff like it in World War II. It, we can only guess. It could have been anything. On the topic of an unsecured hazardous cargo, this makes sense if you think about it. I mentioned that the ship could have been transporting potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin, and those will blow up. The theory is that they got loose in the hold, or seawater found its way into the ship, and it reacted with these chemicals and released a toxic gas and the crew were asphyxiated. Though, why would the ones outside be, and why would the Silver Star crew not also be when they found the ship? And again, why would the radio operator not die at the same time? His message sounds like something was coming for him. Scary. His last words were, I die. So he knew something was about to happen, but how? Maybe he was suffocating as he sent the message? So the rest of this theory is that the seawater would have eventually reacted with the nitroglycerin and caused the fire and the explosion. Another theory is CO, carbon monoxide, poisoning. The theory goes that there was a smoldering fire inside and the ship's boiler room, and it released CO, which then suffocated everyone on board. And then it continued to burn and spread and eventually got out of control and caused the explosion. This one has some issues, though. Like, why did everyone outside the ship, out on deck, still die? I don't really buy this one, personally. I think it has the most holes out of all of the main explanations. One other theory that is not really mainstream but is interesting is that the ship was pirates. Pirates transporting cargo they were paid to transport or something. Piracy isn't uncommon in that area of the world, so it makes sense, and of course then the ship wouldn't be registered. In all likelihood, in this case it might have been masquerading under a false name. Of course, pirates transporting illegal cargo aren't going to document themselves. So, okay, sure, I can see a pirate crew having a dangerous cargo and it accidentally killing them. And if you're thinking pirates attacked the ship, well, that doesn't really make sense because the crew had no signs of injury. And nothing was taken. You know, if pirates are going to attack the ship, they're going to loot it. And that, there's no sign that that happened. Uh, remember, the crew died like they were fighting something, but they had no signs of injuries. So I don't think a pirate attack is the answer either. And there's also an alien theory, but no, just no. One reason people have suggested the ship never even existed was because the records that were searched, including Lloyd's shipping registry, had no record of it. But others have countered that the right records might not have been searched through. Though no matter how many records have been searched over years, the Orang Madan has never been located in any registry. To this day, out of all the records searched, no one has found the name Orang Madan anywhere. And that is pretty strong evidence to the ship not being real. However, there is evidence going the other way, too. Also, some have suggested that the ship, if real, could have been, as I've hinted on, transporting something illegal or secretive, and maybe it was covered up when the shipment was lost. You know, I touched on that in the last section, and there are a number of reasons why it could have been. The Coast Guard obviously thought the mystery was important enough to include in an official publication in 1952. I really tried to find it. It was the, pro it was the Proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council, United States Coast Guard, May 1952, but I could only find the October issue from that year, unfortunately. Though the following quote is from the 1952 um, report the Coast Guard put out. Quote, Their frozen faces upturned to the sun, staring as if in fear. The mouths were open, were gaping open, and the eyes were staring. Unquote. It's creepy. Now, one thing of note is that even though the Orang Madan is a bit dubious, the Silver Star was a real ship. She had a different name at the time the event occurred, but she did exist. And once again, if it was taking nerve agents from China to the U.S., then it obviously would have been kept secret. Again, no paper trail to be left. You gotta remember the political tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time. You know, they were both guarding secrets very closely. They didn't want to know what the other had. So this, and the circumstantial evidence that the ship might have actually been from the Dutch colony of Sumatra, are two points people who believe the ship was real use as evidence along with a few other interesting details as well. 
the international listening posts hearing the SOS at the same time is another of the details that get cited for support that the ship really existed. And new evidence is occasionally still found about the ship. Both sides make compelling arguments, and ultimately there isn't enough evidence either way to prove that the ship was definitely real or not. So I'll leave it up to you to decide what you think. The official story? There isn't one, but most people seem to lean towards the ship being nothing more than an urban legend. Still, I don't know. I think it very well could have been covered up after its cargo was lost. But I will let you make up your own mind on if you think the ship existed or not. You know, think over all the evidence, over all the facts, and make up your own mind. Personally, in my opinion, I think there's truth to this story. We'll probably never know unless every ship manifest from that era is searched through, and even then, if the ship was going under a false name or wasn't registered, we probably wouldn't find it. But I think something did happen, and this story might have occurred. It just seems like there's too many factors at play here for it to be a full hoax. Such as, again, multiple international listening posts hearing the SOS. I learned in my Loch Ness Monster video that stuff like this usually does have some truth to it, so who knows? Imagine if one day a shipwreck was found and it had the name Orang Madan on it. That would be wild, but no one is looking for it, so I doubt that that'll happen. A lot of sunken ships people do look for never get found. And not just in the ocean either, even in the Great Lakes, which are much smaller, ships have sunk and have never been found such as the SS Banakaburn and the SS Chikora. It's obviously a lot harder to find a ship in the ocean, but unlike a lot of the ships which have disappeared at sea, we know the general area the ship should be in if it was real. That can't be said for a lot of ships. Even passenger liners which have vanished sometimes fall into the category of they could be anywhere. Like the Pacific, which ironically went missing in the Atlantic. You know, that one could make a whole video too, but the SS Pacific was never found. It's somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, but we don't know where. The point is, if the Orang Madan exists under that name or another and did sink, unless someone actually looks for it, it probably won't ever be found, and no one seems interested in looking for it, because that would cost a lot of money. Even though we know generally where it should be, and again, that is something we can't say about a lot of ships that have disappeared at sea, I don't think anyone wants to spend that much money looking for something that, you know, might only have a chance of being real. So this story will ultimately never be answered. The story of the Orang Madan has always captured my imagination ever since I first heard about it. It's like the perfect story to embody the horror that the ocean can be. The ocean is a scary place, and ghost ships are creepy. I talk about this in the video, how a ghost ship killed one-third of Norway. And like I said in that, I also think ghost ships are just cool, but very creepy. Especially when people seemingly just vanish without a trace, and the ship is still sailing under its own power, but no one is on it. To me, that is just so creepy. Like, I'd also love a horror movie about the Orang Madan. It could be so scary. A well-done scary movie about this topic would be one of my dream flicks. There's a lot of ghost ships that I could make vi that I could make a video about, like the Mary Celeste, which is probably the most famous one of all. And I thought about making a video on that, but what could I really contribute to the topic? So many videos have been made on that topic, so what 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 could I say that's new? You know, but there are others. The Carol A. Deering, the SS Pachimo which is a ship that drifted abandoned in the ocean for over 30 years. I'm not kidding, look that up. So what do I think, though? After going through all the theories, I really lean towards the idea that the Orang Madan had a nerve agent on board, which got released somehow. You know, I'm not an expert, but this is the general thing, this is what I'm educated in. And it checks a lot of the boxes of it being a nerve agent. Nerve agents will sometimes degrade very quickly, it just depends on the type and they can be terrifyingly lethal in just a tiny dose. It also would make sense that if, that if the ship was carrying this, it would be sailing under a false name or it wouldn't be registered, especially depending on who was going to be receiving the agent. And then the whole thing would be kept quiet after the agent somehow got released. So I think I lean towards the cause of the deaths of everyone on board being a 
Nerve Agent, which somehow got released. Though I admit the theory isn't perfect. You know, in this case, you know, what, what was it that caused the fire? I think the nitroglycerin theory we covered also holds some merit. What do you think killed everyone and destroyed the ship? Let me know. I'm genuinely curious to hear which of these theories you think is, is the one, or if you have your own idea. But I think, for now, I'm in the camp of the story being true, and that a Japanese-made nerve agent was being transported by the ship, and it got accidentally released and killed everyone on board. That theory makes a lot of sense, and if it was going to the U.S. via a method that wouldn't leave a paper trail, I could see it being fully covered up after it went missing. And if the ship was using a false name for the job, then it makes sense that it wouldn't be in any registry. This is not a perfect theory, but it makes a lot of sense. Picture yourself in the 14th century. You're sitting in a small boat and are part of a small team being sent out to investigate the seemingly derelict ship that ran aground near the port. You row out to the vessel on board, intending to speak with the captain and crew about why they have blatantly violated the quarantine procedure your kingdom expects all ships to abide by, only to find the whole crew lying in their bunks, oozing pus and blood from open wounds the size of apples, all having died so fast no one was left to tend to or move the bodies. And you realize what has happened, and it's a nightmare scenario. You look at the people you boarded with in terror and don't know if any of you will survive, or how many other people are about to die because of the horror you found on the ghost ship that drifted into your harbor. Fleeing the ship is probably going to do no good. The worst case scenario has just happened. And untold thousands are about to die. To understand how a ghost ship could kill so many people, and why finding the crew all dead would have been especially terrifying to those who made the discovery, you need to understand the backstory to this event and why the thing this ship was carrying was so dangerous. A good way to get some context is to hear it straight from the written words of someone from the era. Let me say, then, that 1348 years had already passed after the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God, when, into the distinguished city of Florence, there came a deadly pestilence. Either because of the influence of heavenly bodies, or because of God's just wrath as punishment to mortals for our wicked deeds, the pestilence, originating some years earlier in the East, killed an infinite number of people as it spread relentlessly from one place to another, until finally it had stretched its miserable length all over the West. And again, this pestilence, no human wisdom or foresight, was of any avail. Quantities of filth were removed from the city by officials charged with the task. The entry of any sick person into the city was prohibited, and many directives were issued concerning the maintenance of good health. Nor were the humble supplications rendered not once, but many times, by the pious to God, through processions, or by other means, in any way, efficacious. Almost at the beginning of springtime of that year in question, the plague began to show its sorrowful effects in an extraordinary manner. It did not assume the form it had in the East, where bleeding from the nose was a manifest sign of inevitable death but rather showed its first signs in men and women alike by means of swellings, either in the groin or under the armpits, some of which grew to the size of an ordinary apple and others to the size of an egg, more or less. And people called them gabascioli, buboes. And from the two parts of the body already mentioned in very little time, said deadly gabascioli, began to spread indiscriminately over every part of the body. Then, after this, the symptoms of the illness changed to black, or livid spots appearing on the arms and thighs, and on every part of the body. Sometimes, 
There were large ones, and other times a number of little ones scattered all around. And just as the Gabaccioli were originally, and still are, a very definite indication of impending death. In like manner, these spots came to mean the same thing for whoever contracted them. Neither a doctor's advice nor the strength of medicine could do anything to cure this illness. On the contrary, either the nature of the illness was such that it afforded no cure, or else the doctors were so ignorant that they could not recognize its cause and, as a result, could not prescribe the proper remedy. In fact, the number of doctors, other than the well-trained, was increased by the large number of men and women who had never had any medicine training. At any rate, few of the sick were ever cured, and almost all died after the third day of the appearance of the previously described symptoms, some sooner, others later, and most of them died without fever or any other side effects. This pestilence was so powerful that it was transmitted to the healthy by contact with the sick, the way a fire close to dry or oily things will set them aflame. And the evil of the plague went even further. Not only did talking to or being around the sick bring infection and common death, but also touching the clothes of the sick or anything touched by them or used by them seemed to communicate this very disease to the person involved. There were some people who thought that living moderately and avoiding any excess might help a great deal in resisting the disease, and so they gathered in small groups and lived entirely apart from everyone else. They shut themselves up in those houses where there were no sick people, and where one could live well by eating the most delicate of foods and drinking the finest of wines, allowing no one to speak about or listen to anything said about the sick and the dead outside. These people lived, entertaining themselves with music and other pleasures that they could arrange. Others thought the opposite. They believed that drinking excessively, enjoying life, going about singing and celebrating, satisfying in every way appetites as the best one could, laughing and making light of everything that happened, was the best medicine for such a disease. So they practiced to the fullest what they believed by going from one tavern to another all day and night, drinking to excess, and they would often make merry in private homes, doing everything that pleased or amused them most. This they were able to do easily, for everyone felt he was doomed to die and, as a result, abandoned his property, so that most of the houses had become common property, and any stranger who came upon them used them as if her were their rightful owner. Many ended their lives in the public streets during the day or at night, while many others who died in their homes were discovered dead by their neighbors only by the smell of their decomposing bodies. The city was full of corpses. Moreover, the dead were honored with no tears or candles or funeral mourners. In fact, things had reached such a point that the people who died were cared for as we care for goats today. So many corpses would arrive in front of a church every day and every hour that, that the amount of holy ground for burials was certainly insufficient for the ancient custom of giving each body its individual place. When all the graves were full, huge trenches were dug in all of the cemeteries of the churches, and into them the new arrivals were dumped by the hundreds and they were packed in there with dirt, one on top of the other, like a ship's cargo, until the trench was filled. What more can one say, except that so great was the cruelty of heaven, and perhaps also that of man, that from March to July of that same year, between the fury of the pestiferous sickness, and the fact that many of the sick were badly treated or abandoned in need, because of the fear that the healthy had, more than 100,000 human beings are believed to have lost their lives for certain inside of the walls of the city of Florence. Whereas, before the deadly plague, 
one would not even have estimated that there were actually that many people dwelling within the city. The Black Death, as it became known, was the start of the Second Plague pandemic, the first occurring almost a thousand years prior. It also is known as the Pestilence, the Great Mortality, or the Plague, and it was a bubonic plague pandemic which lasted from 1346 to 1353, and it was the worst pandemic in recorded human history. And that's saying something, because there is a list of something like 253 recorded pandemics in human history. And those are just the recorded ones. The Black Death earned its top spot by killing as many as 200 million people from Western Eurasia to Northern Africa. It is spread by fleas and likely person to person through aerosols. Now, there have been many theories about how the Black Death initially began to spread. New theories are still produced today. At the time, it was thought by some that the conjunction of three planets caused the outbreak. Rats, lice, and fleas are a common modern explanation, but no specific theory is universally accepted. The lack of hygiene practices at the time also did not help. The outbreak in Europe began in summer 1347, and by autumn of that same year, it had reached Egypt as well. Mecca was infected in 1348 by pilgrims performing the Haji, one of the five pillars of Islam, and an action that one must do at least once in their lifetime. The text I read from earlier, the Decamrian, was written during the time of the outbreak, and it paints a bleak and vivid picture about what life was like during the worst of the plague. Brother abandoning brother, cures not working, the fear that people felt, people probably thought that the world was ending during the worst of it. Hearing it told from someone who was alive at the time makes it feel more real than it does just reading history articles about it, because it adds that personal touch of authenticity and really lets you imagine what horrors they saw and went through. You can see a real person's first-hand words about it. But a disease isn't just deadly by what it does to those it infects, but also how it spreads. If a disease is crazy dangerous but not able to spread, it'll burn itself out. So how did it spread? And what were its symptoms? And how did people try to treat it? The plague spread around partially due to the ship and trade travel. As any time any ship landed in a port, there was a chance it would bring the plague with it. When infected pests like rats and fleas that carried the plague left the ship upon arriving in a port and spreading once they reached land. Areas with less trade did see less outbreak than other areas with more developed trade routes. People attempting to flee areas with the disease would also bring it to less infected areas as well. One popular method used to try and treat, or even cure, the disease during this time period included what is known as the Vicari method named after the doctor who first proposed its use, which involved taking a healthy chicken and having its back and rear plucked clean of feathers and placed onto the swollen lymph nodes of the infected person. When the chicken began to show signs of illness, doctors assumed it was sucking the disease from the person it was being applied to. Another method used to try and cure the disease was to chop a snake into pieces and rub the diced parts all over the swollen areas. People also made potions, such as the Four Thieves Vinegar. Bloodletting, the withdrawal of blood from a patient to cure a disease, was also used, as well as cleaning the air, because it was thought that bad air caused the disease. Another preventative measure included holding a bouquet of flowers to the face to ward off the bad air and fumigate the lungs. This is where the ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies comes from. Despite these and many, many other supposed cures that existed at the time, there was little effect when it came to real treatments and cures that were successful. Remember the text from earlier. Neither a doctor's advice 
nor the strength of medicine could do anything to cure the illness. On the contrary, either the nature of the illness was such that it afforded no cure, or else the doctors were so ignorant that they could not recognize its cause, and as a result, could not prescribe the proper remedy. Again, it adds that personal touch of authenticity to hear it told from someone who was there and paints a truly bleak and horrifying picture at what it was like to live through this. Symptoms included fever reaching as high as 106 degrees Fahrenheit or 41 degrees Celsius, aching joints, an overall feeling of discomfort, and also vomiting. Gangrene is also possible. However, there also was buboes, an inflammation of the lymph nodes in the groin, neck, and armpits, which oozed blood and pus if opened. Accounts from the time reported that these would grow as large as eggs or even apples. People also commonly had rashes, which could have been the results of the flea bites. Bubonic plague also wasn't the only type going around. There are three forms of plague. They are bubonic plague, septicemic plague, and pneumonic plague. Out of the three, bubonic was the most common and the others have their own unique symptoms, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on from covering the symptoms of those, since the most common type has been covered. And, to, and I want to get to the story that this video is titled after, now that we have context on the era and what the Black Death was. Throughout 1347, 1348, and 1349, the disease continued to spread across Europe, Again, trade and people fleeing heavily infected areas increased the rate of spread, but some areas were lucky and didn't face major outbreaks. One such area was Norway. With the plague spreading, Norway closed itself off and only allowed traders to come ashore following a quarantine period. With travel to Scandinavia as a whole difficult at the time, once they became aware of the outbreak in Europe and Africa, they had time to prepare. With this disease raging everywhere, I'm sure they were taking every precaution to keep it out that they could at the time. Trade was important though, and had to continue, but the authorities were determined to make sure that it was done safely. Knowing that trade ships were partially responsible for spreading the disease, Norway barred merchant ships until they underwent a quarantine period. After the period passed, if the crew were in good health, then they were allowed to leave their ship and unload their cargo. Another thing that was watched for was signs that the ship was infested with fleas and rats. If, if it was, it was not allowed to unload its cargo and it was instead sent back. Overall, the area was kept relatively safe and the simple procedures kept the plague from entering Norwegian shores and cities. The safeguards helped trade continue safely, when elsewhere it was one of the biggest reasons for the spread of the disease. Then, in 1349, one ship, carrying a wool shipment, seemed to break the quarantine rules when it ran aground near Bergen. Why it ran aground was horrifying, because it turns out this ship, which doesn't seem to have a known name, was a ghost ship. Everyone on board was dead. When this ship left port in England, the crew on board were all alive and healthy. We don't know much about the voyage, but we have a few details about what happened based on what was found. Once the outbreak on the ship began, sometime after leaving port, there were likely efforts made to quarantine the sick crew apart from the healthy crew. But, due to the infected rats and fleas on board, the plague continued spreading. It spread person to person, and infected crew members started dying. Until finally, everyone died and the ship was left drifting at sea. If only it had drifted out into the ocean and sank, or ran aground in some remote place where no one would have been in danger. But no, it ran aground offshore near Bergen. By chance, 
the ship would drift into one of the only places where the outbreak hadn't reached. And unfortunately for all the efforts Norway had done to keep itself quarantined from the disease, all of it was in vain. It's not known if Norway was the ship's original destination, but that was where it ended up drifting once everyone had died. You gotta wonder if the last person on board realized that they were alone, and what must have gone through their mind if they did. That would have been horrifying to know that you were alone on a ship with nothing but dead bodies. By the time the ship ran aground and was discovered, no one was left alive to give any kind of report of exactly what had happened. From this ghost ship, the disease spread into the region by rats and fleas, the, the only ones left on board who were alive. From there, the outbreak then spread further into Russia and Sweden. By the time it was all over, what that ghost ship brought to Norway killed as much as one-third of the whole population. You really gotta wonder, what did the people who found the wrecked ship and the bodies on board think? Someone had to be sent to investigate the ship when it ran aground. And did any of them survive the outbreak? They might have expected a crew simply violating quarantine, but instead, they found the worst case scenario they could have. Truly though, they must have thought they walked into a nightmare and it truly does have the plot of a horror movie that we might see today. That whole scenario is legitimately scary. A ship drifting into your country and crashing, and when you go investigate, you just find everyone is dead. Can you imagine how that would, how that would be to find that? It'd be horrifying. And then from there, the rats and fleas escape and spread into the country where you've kept this scary disease from faraway places out for so long, and then everyone you know starts dying? It's such a creepy way for the outbreak to arrive. And the fact it killed maybe as many as one-third of everyone in the country just makes it even more horrifying. So the disease spread, it's run rampant all over Northern Africa, and now Russia, and everywhere in between. So what happened next? During this time, the disease continued to spread across Europe, Africa, and into the Middle East. However, details about the outbreak that occurred in Norway are sparse, but we have more complete records from Western Norway specifically. We know the ship likely ran aground in August, and the outbreak had become widely spread by that autumn. Western and Eastern Norway were both severely impacted, though the effects of the disease in Northern Norway are basically unknown. But we do know that by 1500, the population of Norway was only half of what it had been in 1300. Even roughly 150 years after the outbreak, the population of the country had only returned to half the levels that had been before it. Because of the impact of the Black Death in the country, Norway lost its position as a major kingdom and basically stagnated for centuries. Again, when you look at the numbers and read testimony from the actual people who were there, people at the time really must have thought the world was ending. And who can blame them? The disease didn't just go away after a while. It had outbreaks from 1374 all the way throughout 1400, 1438 to 39, 1456 to 57, 1464 to 66, 1481 to 85, 1500 to 1503, 1518 to 31, 1544 to 48, 1563 to 66, 1573 to 88, 1596 to 99, 1602 to 1611, 1623 to 40, 1644 to 1654, and 1664 to 1667. The second plague pandemic lasted centuries, with small outbreaks basically occurring every year throughout Europe. The outbreak in the middle 14th century killed so many people that it definitively earned the title as the worst pandemic in history. While we'll never know exact numbers, they estimate 
in range from 40 to 60 percent of Europe's population died and in, and it took centuries to bounce back to what it had been before the outbreak. The outbreak later became known as the Black Death because of this. The second plague pandemic would last from the 14th century to as late as the early 19th century, consisting of multiple outbreaks throughout these centuries, some far more severe than others. The Great Plague of London from 1665 to 1666 was the last major bubonic plague outbreak of the second plague pandemic to occur in England. The third plague pandemic would begin in the 19th century and last from 1855 until 1859, though it was considered active until as late as 1960. This was the third of the three pandemics, with the Black Death marking the beginning of the second. Despite all the horror out of the pandemics, the fact that one of the outbreaks occurred because a ship whose whole crew was dead drifted into one of the only places the plague hadn't reached is still one of the creepiest stories from all of it. You really gotta wonder what the full story of the outbreak on that ship was and what the last person alive was thinking. Maybe they, maybe they laid in their bed unaware? Maybe they tried to steer the ship out to sea to spare others from suffering their fate? Maybe they knew they were all alone and surrounded by the dead bodies of their fellow crew who had days earlier been alive and healthy, and there was nothing that they could do but wait to die too, all alone. Whoever the last person on the ship was, their final hours could make a horror story just as much as what the people who found the wrecked ship discovered could. So many questions can be asked about the details of the outbreak on the ship, that we don't have answers to because no one was alive to record the details. Ultimately, we will never know exactly what happened, but we know what happened because of it. Do you ever just read a story and after you're done, it just makes you say, oh my God, because it was just that horrifying? Well, that's today's story in a nutshell. You think the 14th century ghost ship that killed one third of Norway was bad? I'd probably rather die on that one instead of this one. I'd rather die on the Titanic instead of this one. Yeah, it's that bad. We're going to 19th century England for this one to talk about the sinking of the SS Princess Alice, who collided with another ship, was split in half, and sank into raw sewage. And if you know anything about how people were and how they dressed back in the 19th century, they wore a lot of wool and heavy clothing which took on water and literally dragged these people down into it. This all occurred in less than five minutes. This is a pretty harrowing one today, so let's get to it. The Princess Alice was a British passenger paddle steamer built in Greenock, Scotland in 1865. By 1878, the year she sank, she was owned by the Woolrich Steam Packet Company. Her captain was William R. H. Grinstead. Now the ship actually wasn't an ocean sailing ship. She sailed and carried passengers from Swan Pier, not far from London Bridge, downstream to a few stops and then back again. It was a fun and easy way for families to get out and about for the day, and it was faster than other transportations of the day. At the time of her sinking, she could carry 936 passengers when in calm water. When she was purchased by the Woolwich Steam Packet Company, they overhauled her a bit and they made several changes to modernize her just a little bit. They not only added new boilers, but also five watertight compartments which could be closed off in the event of an incident where the hall was punctured or gashed open and allowing water to flood in. You know, and say, a collision. You like that? That's what we call foreshadowing in the story. She was inspected and passed by the British Board of Trade following these upgrades. Now, there's a few other parts of this story which we need to set up on the chessboard before we get to the sinking. One of these pieces being the ship SS Bywall Castle which, ironically, is a ship I could include in 
my videos about ships which disappeared at sea, Bywall Castle was a passenger and cargo ship, and as far as ships back in the day went, she was big. She was a big girl, and probably would have looked like a behemoth compared to the Princess Alice. She weighed 1,376 gross tons compared to the Princess Alice's 432 gross tons. This is the ship the Princess Alice would collide with on the 3rd of September. Now, there's something else you need to know. Princess Alice was sailing up the river right into the path of where London's sewage pumping stations were located, and twice a day, they released a total of 75 million imperial gallons of raw sewage from the sewer outfalls. This occurred one hour before all hell would break loose. So the water was filled with runoff and release from not only the sewage plant, but also from several local chemical factories and slaughterhouses. There was also oil and petroleum in the water as well, released from an accidental fire which occurred earlier in the day. The Times described it as this, quote, two continuous columns of decomposing, fermenting sewage, hissing like soda water with baneful gases, so black that the water was stained for miles and discharging a corrupt carnal house odor that will be remembered by all as being particularly depressing and sickening. This was the toxic, hissing, like soda as the text described it, soup the Princess Alice was sailing into. A soup which turned the river water pure black. Okay, with all the pieces on the chessboard, let's start moving the pawns. On September 3rd, the Princess Alice was making a what was called a moonlight trip, which sounds lovely, from Swan Pier near London Bridge to some ports further downstream and then back again. Now, what's kind of a neat detail is that since these passenger ships took people up and down river for a day or evening, the passengers didn't have to worry about missing the vessel they came on when it departed again. This is because the London Steamboat Company owned several ships, and passengers could use their ticket on any of them. That's just neat that they didn't have to buy several tickets. Passengers could interchange between ships throughout the day. On screen now is actually one of the tickets from the September 3rd moonlight trip. At 6.30 p.m. that evening, Princess Alice departed for her return trip back upriver. I bet the mood on board was good. People were having a ball out on deck enjoying the night or down in the saloon having a drink. Meanwhile, heading downstream towards the Princess Alice, Bywell Castle was proceeding ahead at five knots. She was keeping to the middle of the river, except for when she had to move to the side to avoid other vessels. Meanwhile, the Princess Alice was traveling upriver against the tide, following the normal practice of seeking the slack water on the south side of the river. Captain Dix of the Bywell Castle saw the Princess Alice's red port light on a course which would take her to pass by the starboard side of his ship. However, at the same time, Captain Grinstead then decided to move into the center of the river. All of a sudden, there the two ships were, sailing straight towards each other. Maybe Grinstead did it because he expected the bigger ship to move to the side, but either way, the two ships were now dead level with each other and sailing straight towards each other. What was about to happen would result in the greatest loss of life of any British inland waterway shipping accident. Seeing the collision was imminent, Captain Grinstead's voice rang out amid the calamity as he shouted out to the larger vessel, Where are you coming to? Good God, where are you coming to? Despite the larger ship trying to maneuver around the Princess Alice, it was too late. And everyone could only watch as what happened next occurred. The Princess Alice tried to reverse back, but it was too late. The larger ship bore down on her and smashed right into her. The collision was so violent that the Princess Alice was split clean in half. 
It was so violent, her boilers were ripped free from inside her and dumped out of the opening into the river. The deck of the Princess Alice was filled with passengers, and it was such a violent crash that many were thrown into the river instantly. In four minutes, the ship would be underwater. Now, let's cover everything which happened in those horrifying four minutes. The Bywall Castle dropped ropes from their deck to let the Princess Alice passengers climb up. They also threw anything which would float into the river. Now, there's something you need to know about how people dressed at the time. I mentioned this at the beginning, but the common attire people wore included heavy clothing and clothes made out of wool. And women also wore long dresses, which made swimming even harder. Clothes like these take on water and get heavy in water very, very fast. And a lot of people at the time just didn't know how to swim. So they sank into the river and drowned. Also remember what was in the water at the time. These people were literally drowning in a river of raw sewage, which was also mixed with dead animals and toxic industrial waste. Many others died after being rescued because they drank some of this water in the chaos. The Bywall Castle also launched a lifeboat, which rescued 14 people from the water. And other ships nearby, which saw what was happening, did the same and launched their own boats to rescue people. Meanwhile, on the sinking ship, people were being thrown into the water as the decks slid deeper down. And people rushed for both the bow and stern. The Princess Alice had been struck at about a 13-degree angle on her starboard side, just forward of the paddle wheels. Princess Alice also, as I mentioned, had watertight compartments, but they were no good in this situation. And it wasn't just chaos occurring on the decks. There were people below decks, too, when the collision occurred. Out of all those who had been drinking in the salon or were just in various areas of the ship, only two survived. Everyone else was trapped below when the ship sank. Divers who went into the wreck later said that there were bodies of people jammed together in doorways, most of which were still standing upright. What an eerie sight that would have been in the murky river water. I really gotta wonder how many people clung onto the bow and stern of the ship as it filled with water and sank, and how many others chose to jump overboard before she went under and tried to swim for rescue, and how many families were separated by the ship being split in half, and did any of them ever see each other again? Just like with the sinking of the RMS Titanic just shy of 34 years later, the Princess Alice broke into three pieces as she sank. If you didn't know, Titanic split into a bow, stern, and middle section. And like the more famous ship, Princess Alice broke apart into three pieces as well as she quickly sank. By the time Princess Alice's sister ship, which was only 10 minutes behind her, arrived at the scene, everything had fallen silent. One writer at the time described how the river was filled with screams of human agony for a few minutes after the collision. Then one by one, fathers, mothers, and little children were swallowed up by the toxic water of death. Survivors called it maddening excitement so intense they couldn't forget it if they lived for a century after the sinking. Passengers were spread across 100 yards of the toxic river, having been thrown overboard in the collision, been washed overboard in the sinking, or jumped from the ship before it went down. Some had likely even clung on to the end, but in only mere minutes, the screams were replaced with silence, and everyone there to witness it knew it was over. Hundreds of people had slipped below the water's surface and drowned in the sludge and been swept away downstream. 130 or so people were hauled out of the river, and between 600 and 700 people died in the sinking. The Bywall Castle's captain and first mate wrote the following in the ship's log after docking later that night. At 6.30, left the west dock, mill wall, in charge of Mr. Dix. Proceeding slowly, the master and pilot being on the upper bridge, light air and weather a little hazy. At 7.45 p.m. proceeding at half speed down Galleon's Reach, being about the center of the reach, observed an excursion steamer coming up Barking Reach, showing her red and masthead lights, when we ported our helm to keep over towards Tripcock Point. As the vessel neared, observed that the other steamer had ported, and immediately afterwards saw that she had starboarded and was trying to cross our bows, 
showing her green light close under the port bow. Seeing collision inevitable, stopped our engines and reversed full speed when the two vessels collided, the bow of the Bywall Castle cutting into the other steamer, which was crowded with passengers with a dreadful crash. Took immediate means for saving life by hauling up over the bows several men of the passengers, throwing ropes ends over all around the ship, throwing over four life buoys, a hold ladder, and several planks, and getting out three boats, keeping the whistle blowing loudly all the time for assistance, which was rendered by several boats from shore and a boat from a passing steamer. The excursion steamer, which turned out to be Princess Alice, turning over and sinking under the bows, succeeded in rescuing a great many of passengers and anchored for the night. About 8.30 p.m., the steamer Duke of Tech came alongside and took off such passengers as had not been taken to shore in the boats. Again, Princess Alice sank into the toxic water in four minutes. It took me longer to describe her sinking than it took to actually occur. Imagine if you were there and you saw all this happen this quickly, or, heaven forbid, were on the Princess Alice when this happened. It is nothing short of a nightmare scenario. Getting the bodies out of the river became a pretty big priority. They not only littered the bottom of the river and beaches around where the collision occurred, but they were being found miles upon miles downstream. Immediately after the sinking, news was telegraphed about the ship going down, and families of those who had been passengers on the Alice hurried to, hurried to the London steamboat offices to wait for more news. By the next day, the crowds, which consisted of both family and sightseers, forced extra police to be brought in in order to control them. As bodies began to be recovered from the murky river water, relatives had to travel to both sides of the river multiple times to search for missing family members as more and more were found. The bodies were being recovered by not only those finding them washed up, but also by local watermen who had been hired for two pounds a day to search for bodies, being paid an additional five shillings for each body they recovered. This actually caused people to fight over corpses. I'm not kidding. People were literally fighting over corpses of people who died in the sinking just for some extra pocket change. One of the bodies found was that of Princess Alice's captain. Captain Grinstead had died with his ship. All the bodies were covered in sludge, which people found very difficult to clean off. The chemicals and high bacteria levels in the water also caused the corpses to decay at a faster rate than normal, causing many to be found heavily bloated. People's clothing also quickly rotted in the water. The rate of decomposition was so accelerated that many people were buried without ever getting their identities back. The, uh, the unidentified were buried on September 9th in a mass grave. The coffins all carried a police identification number, the same number which was also attached to the clothing and personal items from each person, which were retained in order to aid with later identification. And just because people survived the sinking didn't mean they were out of the water yet, so to speak. Several of those who had been submerged in the polluted water grew ill, and 16 survivors died in just a few weeks. Several others also fell sick from being in the water, but I'm pretty sure only 16 actually died from it. The bodies weren't the only thing recovered. The Princess Alice was also recovered from the river bottom. In fact, before she was even recovered, parts of her railing could be seen above the waterline at low tide. The diver I mentioned earlier was sent into the wreck to have a look around and see if she could be raised. As I mentioned, he found bodies inside the ship, clogging doorways and passageways. And he also was the one who found that the ship had split into three sections, a bow section, a stern section, and a section around the boilers. The fourth section was 90 feet long, and it was beached at 2 a.m. on the 7th of September, during low tide. As it was being towed to shore, Bywall Castle actually was sailing past. People came out the next day to have a look, and more fights broke out, this time over the best place to watch from. People even plundered the wreck for souvenirs. This disaster did not bring out the best in people. It took 250 more policemen being drafted to control the crowd. By evening, most of the crowd had gone home, and shortly after, the aft section of the Princess Alice had also been raised, and it was beached next to the bow section. 
As I mentioned earlier, the number of people who had died is believed to have been between 600 and 700. No passenger list was kept on Princess Alice, so we don't know for sure. It was thought that up to 80 people were never recovered from the river. 640 bodies were recovered in the end, though. One of the changes that came about because of the incident was that sewage was no longer just dumped into the river. But instead, it was purified. And six sludge boats took the rest, which could not be treated, far out to sea and dumped it there. This practice continued until 1998, by the way. It was also determined that the Princess Alice was overloaded with people and did not have enough life-saving equipment on board for the crowd. And her crew were at fault for not following the right-of-way rules for ships on the river. Princess Alice's engines were recovered and salvaged, but the rest of the ship was sold to a shipbreaker as scrap. As I mentioned earlier, the Bywall Castle later disappeared at sea without a trace, and I'll leave that story there so I can maybe talk about it in the next installment of the Ships Which Vanished at Sea series. You know, I find this particular picture haunting to look at. This is the stern section of the ship after it was pulled ashore and beached, you can clearly see where she split in half, and one man standing on her, almost like a ghost or specter of some kind, overlooking the scene. It's just off-putting and even otherworldly to look at, at least in my opinion. Also known as the SS Java, then the SS Zealand, then the Electric, and then finally the Lord Spencer, she was a Cunard line vessel built in Glasgow and launched in June 1865. She was powered by steam, but as you can see from the picture, was also propelled by her sails. You see, the Lord Spencer existed in what I've come to call the hybrid phase of ships, a time period in the transition from sail to steam power, which resulted in some very unique looking vessels. At this time, ships relied on both sources for propulsion. The Lord Spencer and other vessels like her needed the ability to use their sails in case their mechanical engines failed, which happened all the time back then. The liner could comfortably carry passengers within her accommodations, and her maiden voyage under the name SS Java took her from Liverpool to Queenstown, and then finally to New York, where she triumphantly and safely arrived. Becoming known as the Lord Spencer in 1892, she enjoyed many long crossings throughout her roughly 30-year career, and I'm sure she was loved by many passengers who sailed upon her. But her fate was to be mysterious, and a tragic one, and one shrouded in many unanswered questions. During a voyage in 1895, the Lord Spencer went missing while traveling her route around South America from San Francisco to New York. No one knows what truly happened to the ship, but I'll tell you the most popular theory. Picture yourself standing on the deck of a three-masted vessel on a foggy night. All is calm, quiet, until a massive, multi-masted liner comes out of the dark mist silently like a ghost, looming over you and drawing nearer and smashes into you. This is no sailor's horror story of a haunted ghost ship running you down. This is real life. The ship you are on is the Prince Oscar, and this horror movie type scene really occurred on a night out at sea. The Prince Oscar was a fully rigged transport sailing ship built in 1865 like the Lord Spencer. On the night of the 13th of July, 1895, after enjoying a 30-year career, she was lost in a nighttime collision with an unknown four-masted ship in the South Atlantic Ocean. The two ships sank in 10 minutes, the other vessel sinking so fast that the Prince Oscar survivors didn't even get a real glimpse of her at all, gone as suddenly as she appeared. All on board the mystery ship were lost. She went down so fast no one on the Prince Oscar could get a good look at her to identify her or maybe see her name. And the survivors of the Prince Oscar were picked up after three days floating in the open lifeboats following the sinking. Back then, ships had no wireless sets, so they couldn't have called for help even if there had been time to do so. Though many believe the Lord Spencer was the ship that collided with the Prince Oscar, we will never know, but many believe this is the case and the cause for the Lord Spencer's loss. A few other ships have been proposed as candidates for this mysterious ghostly ship that came out of the fog like a monster as well, such as the Lord Downshire and the Holt Hill. 
tell me if you think the mystery ship was indeed the Lord Spencer or not. Personally, I think it's very likely since she vanished around the time the collision occurred. Another theory is that the Lord Spencer sank while rounding Cape Horn, but this isn't as popular of a proposal. Today, the Lord Spencer does not enjoy the legacy of a liner like the Titanic. She is all but forgotten entirely, as are the stories which played out on her in that final voyage. Her wreck rests somewhere on the bottom of the ocean, undiscovered to this day, and that will likely never change. But I wish it would. I find this story so fascinating and I would love definitive answers on it, but likely that will never come to pass. The true fate of the Lord Spencer will likely never be confirmed, and her wreck will remain forgotten and abandoned deep below the surface with those who were in her care at the time they were lost. I feel the only way the wreck will be found is if it is happened upon by pure chance. Okay, this is a ship I've indirectly mentioned before, but it was requested I cover it, so let's actually hear her story. For this one, let's jump forward in time, 85 years, to 1980. This is the story of the MV Derbyshire. Built in 1976, the MV Derbyshire was 294 meters long and weighed 91,655 gross registered tons. She was a British oil bulk oil or bulk oil combination carrier, say it five times fast, I dare you, that entered service in June 1976, around six months after she was launched in December 1975. She would spend two years of her four-year service laid up. The Derbyshire was huge. Godzilla would have trouble sinking this ship. She could carry 160,000 tons of cargo. Of course, there were larger vessels. The Nock Nevis, I believe the largest ship ever built, was... 485 meters long, which is 1,500 feet, and weighed 260,941 gross register tons. So while the Derbyshire was huge, she was far from the largest ship ever built. The MV Derbyshire left for what would be her final voyage on July 11th, 1980. She left Quebec, Canada, for her destination in Okinawa, Japan. Her route would take her down across the Atlantic, around the southern tip of Africa, and then back up towards Japan. She would sink on September 10th, 1980, and when she failed to reach her destination on September 15th, a search was launched but was called off on September 20th, 1980. All that was found was an oil slick. No sign of the ship, her 42 crew members, or the two passengers who were on board were located. All were lost with the ship. Whatever happened, happened so fast that there wasn't even time to send a distress call. Six weeks after the Derbyshire sank, one of her lifeboats was sighted by a Japanese tanker floating alone and empty in the open ocean. So what happened? Well, let's cover the theories. A popular one is that the ship was lost in a typhoon, and with hindsight, with what was learned later, this is essentially correct. A government investigation at the time also supported this, believing that the ship had hove to in Typhoon Orchid, 230 miles from Okinawa, the tropical storm became so severe that the Derbyshire was either struck or rolled over by a rogue wave, or had her hatch covers blown off and filled with water, and then rapidly sank. Reminds me of the fate the El Faro suffered. And there are other theories, but that was always the most popular one. Another one suggests that a design fault due to a misalignment of the bulkheads opened several sh cracks in the ship's hull and caused her to take on water and eventually go down. But since there was no distress signal, this doesn't really make sense. And again, with hindsight, we know that that's not what happened. But even just ignoring what we learned later, the idea of cracks opening in the hull and the ship, you know, flooding and sinking, but there being no distress signal, that doesn't really make sense when the idea of a rogue wave suddenly hitting the ship is also on the table. Now, there is more to the story. In 1994, a search for the wreck was launched. They found the shipwreck and used ROVs to survey her. They found that a hatch on the forward deck had not been secured. They found that since the hatch wasn't sealed, the forward section took on water in the storm, and the ship suffered sudden structural failure in her forward section once the flooding became too much. However, an investigation of the wreck in 2000 absolved the crew of some of the carelessness that was pointed at them in 1994. This investigation found that there was significant damage to the forward vents. With the vents out of service, the ship began to flood, 
and go down by the head. Once the hatch covers became submerged in the water, they failed, and the holds flooded. Multiple cargo holds quickly flooded, and the ship sank. This explanation for the sinking appears to be the one that is most agreed upon today. A bronze plaque was placed on the wreck as a memorial to those lost. Indeed, they can be properly mourned by family because, for once in this series, we have answers. We have found the ship. The MV Derbyshire has been found, though she was missing for a time. She has been found. We know what happened. And now that they have been found, let's hope that she and her crew can rest in peace. The 20th anniversary of the sinking was marked with a memorial service at Liverpool. Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott was among those in attendance. In 2018, a permanent monument to the lost was erected in the garden at the Church of Our Lady and St. Nicholas in Liverpool. Today, the MV Derbyshire remains the largest British vessel to be lost at sea. Okay, now we're going back in time again. This story is much closer to the disappearance of the Lord Spencer than it is to the sinking of the Derbyshire. This is the story of the Florence. I had never heard of this story until recently, and I knew right away I wanted to share it. The Florence was an American clipper, a type of 19th century merchant sailing vessel built specifically for speed. She was built in 1877, and her job was to transport goods from California to cities on the Atlantic coast. She was launched in October 1877 and began her career on the 20th of April 1878 when she left New York bound for San Francisco. She arrived on August 4th and this completed her maiden voyage after 106 days at sea. This was her job for the next several decades. This speedy little ship would run raw trade goods from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast and vice versa. By the 1890s, this type of work began to drop in demand. There were simply faster ways. And suddenly, ships like the Florence were left without a purpose. However, the Florence had a new career waiting her. After a brief idle from work, this speedy girl was bought by the California Shipping Company to carry lumber from the Pacific Northwest to Honolulu. The Florence now had a new route, a new challenge. Brave the vast Pacific Ocean. And she would, until her story reached its mysterious end. The ship vanished with all hands in 1902 and was never, and has never, been seen since. A fruitful career over, just like that. One of her life preservers was found a year later, but no other traces of the ship or her crew have ever been found. Most believe the Florence was lost somewhere just off the coast of Washington due to bad weather, likely a sudden gale. In all these videos, we have not talked about a single ship that vanished in the Gulf of Mexico. And you know what? Let's change that. Ships have gone missing there too, and let's talk about one. We're zooming ahead now to the 1960s for this one and talking about the SS Marine Sulphur Queen. Formerly known as the Esso New Haven, she was a T2 tanker converted to carry, get this, molten sulfur. Who could have guessed? She had a steam system running through her that kept the molten sulfur at 255 degrees Fahrenheit or 123 degrees Celsius. The ship was launched in 1944 and began her final voyage on February 2nd, 1963, after a very long career at sea. The Queen left port in Baymont, Texas with a cargo of sulfur weighing 15,260 tons. On February 4th, while she was somewhere off the southern coast of Florida, a radio message was sent by one of the ship's crew. Nothing was wrong, the message was ordinary, and the ship's position was given as 25 degrees, 45 minutes north, 86 degrees, 0 minutes west, putting her well off the coast, but almost directly west of Naples, Florida. Nothing more was heard, and the Marine Sulphur Queen was listed as missing when she failed to arrive in port as scheduled. A search of the Straits of Florida, the area the ship was believed to have gone down in, was launched but called off after 19 days. Only some debris and life preservers were found, but no traces of the ship or any of her 39 crew were. The theory was that she sank in a bad storm. The sea at the time was known to be rough, with waves reaching 16 feet high. The Coast Guard investigation also found that 
other things were wrong with the ship, any one of which should have kept her in port. Among the many, one of the most important of these was the incidents, yes, multiple, of fire breaking out beneath and along the sides of the four large sulfur tanks. One former crew member revealed that these fires were so common that the crew of the Sulfur Queen had simply given up on setting off the alarm when they occurred. Caked on layers of sulfur was also found in spaces below the tanks due to the many cracks in the ship's structure. The Marine Sulfur Queen was also a type of ship known for having a, quote, weak back. This was another factor the Coast Guard took notice of. The ship was, in all honesty, likely to split in half, likely near midships due to corrosion, and it had happened on several T2 tankers before. Another former crew member testified that the corrosion was everywhere. Other things that were revealed to be wrong included inoperable temperature gauges, a ruptured steam coil, and worn packing around the screws. The Marine Suffer Queen was scheduled for a dry dock inspection in 1963, but her owners had postponed it. The ship was in such a bad state that right before her final voyage, the wife of one crewman called her a floating garbage can. With all that covered, and all the factors in consideration, like her dry dock inspection being postponed by her owners, this tragedy was completely avoidable, and it's unfortunate that the Marine Sulphur Queen's crew had to pay that price with their lives. The Coast Guard suggested in their investigation that the cause for the loss could have been any one of multiple possibilities, such as there being an explosion in the cargo tanks, a complete failure of the vessel's hull, which may have resulted in it breaking in two, capsized because of the weather, or that a steam explosion may have occurred as a result of rapid filling of the void space with water. Either way, the Marine Sulphur Queen vanished at sea, and as far as I know, her wreck has never been found. In all likelihood, she might not even be in one piece. Like with the USS Cyclops, a ship we covered earlier in this series, the story of the Marine Sulphur Queen has been used by many to promote theories about the Bermuda Triangle, even though this one's loss wasn't so very mysterious. It sounds like this old girl was just about to fall apart and collapse. But nonetheless, conspiracy theorists use this incident as one of many to justify their beliefs into the Bermuda Triangle legends. USS Lynx, a six-gun Baltimore clipper-rigged schooner, was built for the United States Navy in 1814, with her planned job being part of one of two raiding squadrons being built by President James Madison's administration's plan to establish a more effective navy. A navy that would not only be capable of breaking the ongoing British Navy blockade, remember this is the War of 1812, but also causing havoc on British merchant marine trading. The Lynx began her commission in 1815, sailing from Boston and arriving at the northern African coast about a month after leaving. The ship returned to the United States in 1817 and eventually found herself stationed in the Gulf of Mexico to patrol and operate along the southern U.S. coast. In 1819, she captured two separate pirate vessels in the Gulf, and 11 days later captured a third as well. In 1820, she departed St. Mary's, Georgia, bound for Kingston, Jamaica. Upon her arrival, she would continue to hunt and capture pirates, but she never made it. Somewhere along that voyage, for reasons completely unknown, the ship utterly vanished. No traces of her or her 47 crew members have ever been found, and it's likely that this is never going to change. The cause for the loss is completely unknown, and there are no real theories. Perhaps multiple pirates attacked her and turned the tables on her, or she sank in a storm. No one knows. The fact is, something happened along that voyage, and the ship, along with her crew, were never heard from again. going the furthest back into history we've gone yet in this video for this one, and talking about another early U.S. Navy ship. In fact, this ship was part of the Continental Navy, the Navy that was the Navy for the 13 colonies in the American Revolutionary War, before the U.S. gained its independence from Britain. The USS Saratoga was thus one of the earliest Navy ships in U.S. history. She was a sloop, and the first ship named to honor the Battle of Saratoga, fought in 1777. There have been many named as such since. The first USS Saratoga was launched in 1780 and lost at sea the next year in 1781. In a situation 
that almost sounds supernatural. This straight up sounds like a ghost ship story or something. This is the story of the USS Saratoga and her unsettling disappearance. First, a little about the ship. The Saratoga was 58 feet long and had a beam of 25 feet. The ship's service began as a diplomatic escort, escorting the packet Mercury, which was sailing for Europe carrying Henry Lawrence, the former president of the Continental Congress, who was planning to seek money from the European continent to finance the fledgling American government. Eventually things went wrong and the Mercury had to carry on alone and she was captured by the British off Newfoundland. Afterward, the USS Saratoga remained off Delaware, east of the shipping lanes, until her captain had her ready for a fight. Sp Spotting an unknown ship, she pursued, and two hours later was near to what turned out to be the brig HMS Keppel. Saratoga opened fire at the British ship, and for three hours the two vessels fired at each other. But due to the unfavorable winds, neither could get an advantage over the other, and the skirmish eventually ended when the Saratoga headed for home shortly after midnight. Neither ship suffered any serious damage. The ship later went on to capture several enemy vessels, and eventually a new crew came aboard to replace the ones who had left to man the ships they'd captured as prizes. After this happened, the ship continued its job and captured yet more ships. By March 1871, the Saratoga found herself as part of a small fleet escort in Cape Francis, alongside French warships and Continental warships. They were to escort the waiting 29 heavily loaded merchant ships who were waiting at the harbor for their guard to arrive. The convoy joined and left Cape Francis on March 15, 1781. Three days later, unknown sails were spotted in the distance and the Saratoga broke off to pursue these unknown ships. She caught one of the fleeing ships by mid-afternoon and they surrendered without a fight. Saratoga's captain, Captain Young, placed an American crew on board the prize ship and immediately set off to chase the other fleeing vessel. The captured ship attempted to keep up as the Saratoga sped off into the horizon ahead, when suddenly, a wind that grew to a fearful gale arose and the captured vessel nearly capsized from the velocity of the intense winds. Midshipman Penfield, commanding the captured ship, managed to get her under control and looked up, only to see the Saratoga was gone. Just like that. She vanished. So quickly, it was like she was plucked out of reality itself. Saratoga vanished without a trace along with her entire crew. This is a weird one. How did it happen so fast? How did not one person see it? This one just happened so fast, it's scary, and it sounds like an episode out of the Twilight Zone or some supernatural trap where the second ship wasn't even real and it was luring the Saratoga like a siren. It's a proper ghost ship story. It's creepy. Whatever happened to the Saratoga had to have happened quickly, but that exact thing is unknown. Despite all her victories and prizes, she vanished into the sea. It's not much of a fitting end. To this day, the cause for the sudden loss remains a mystery, and her wreck, or what might be left of it, has never been found. The ship was officially declared, lost at sea with all hands drowned, on March 18th, 1781. You have to wonder... If she hadn't left the convoy and remained in service, what her fate would have been, and what happened. Because, man, this one almost does sound supernatural. The way she was just gone so fast. The way the wind came out of nowhere and then went away just like that, taking the Saratoga with it. Just creepy. Ghost ship story, definitely. Definitely could also fit into the Twilight Zone. Talk about a bit of unsettling history. Okay, full disclosure, this one is cheating. This ship didn't vanish at sea, probably. It just vanished from history. You'll see what I mean. The records of this ship just abruptly end. This is cheating, 100%, I admit it. But I thought it was interesting. But since it's cheating, I'm gonna get through this one fast. Just like this ship was. The Hurricane was a large, extreme clipper. A type of clipper designed to sacrifice cargo capacity for speed with a bow lengthened above the water and a sharpened forward body. The Hurricane herself was built in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1851 and has been described as the most intense extreme clipper ever built, apparently earning that Hurricane name. 
She was fast, getting up to a speed of 18 knots. Okay, yeah, that's really fast for the time. The ship could make the San Francisco-New York trip in 100 days, even with poor wind conditions slowing her down. Had the wind held up, she might have claimed the record for the fastest trip from New York to San Francisco at the time. But it wasn't meant to be. Nonetheless, she had a very speedy and fruitful career. But in the interest of not boring you all, I won't list all the places she went. Let's just say that she really got around. Until 1857, anyway. You see, around this time, she ended up laid up with no work due to an economic depression. Labor-intense vessels like the Hurricane struggled in this time. In 1858, the Hurricane was placed back into commission service in the hopes that she could attract a buyer. On January 8, 1859, she departed San Francisco with Ichabod Sherman in command. The Hurricane, ironically, experienced very poor weather on this voyage, but made the trip safely in 143 days of passage. She then sailed for Singapore, where she sold to the equivalent today of $977,000 in U.S. money. She's mentioned here and there afterward, but most of her career from this point is unknown. And then in the 1870s, she simply vanished from all records. And that's it. The hurricane is never mentioned again in recorded history, not even in shipping registries. Whatever fate ultimately befell her, be it a long and fruitful career with her new owners, or a tragic end somewhere, we'll never know. She sailed so fast, history's writers couldn't keep up with her, and in the end, it seems history has lost what her fate ultimately was. Her last mention in a shipping registry was in 1876, and after that, she vanished from all records like a ghost. And no one knows what ultimately became of her. Whatever her final fate was, it is unclear to this day. Okay, that wraps up this installment of Ships That Vanished at Sea. You know, we've covered so many in the series, but man, the Saratoga really got to me. That one was just unsettling. That it happened so fast when she was in plain view of another ship, and then just gone? You see what I mean when I said it almost sounds like something supernatural happened? Like she sailed right out of reality? It's crazy. Again, it really does sound like an episode you'd see on the Twilight Zone. Just imagine that. A captured ship, trying to keep up with the Saratoga. Suddenly, the wind picks up, and when the wind passes, the Saratoga is just gone like she was never there. So creepy. I get the chills just thinking about that. Well, with these stories told, we've reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed and found these interesting. One thing I enjoy about this series a lot as it goes along is learning about these very obscure missing ships that aren't widely remembered. The earlier episodes had more well-known ones, but now that we've covered them, we're getting into the really obscure and weird stories. Tell me, which of these stories was your favorite? For me, it's a tie between the USS Saratoga and the Lord Spencer. And tell me, if any of these ships could be found again, which would you like to see found the most and why? For me, it would probably be the Lord Spencer. I know it's just a ship, a hunk of metal and wood. They have personality and feel alive the same way that like an abandoned building feels, and I think it would be right to find one that has been nearly forgotten for so long. It's human nature to feel that way to some inanimate things, but you get what I mean, right? She is something once loved that now no one remembers. She's probably lonely wherever she is. It would be fitting to find her. It almost feels like you can give the ships themselves, and maybe those who were with them when they went down, peace if you find them. But that's my pick. Tell me yours. Also, like and subscribe if you enjoy videos like this and you want to see more like it so that I know you do. Now, before I go, here are some quick announcements, so if you don't want to see those, feel free to feel free to go. Thank you for watching. The next video will possibly be the secret project I mentioned in Obscure Mysteries Volume 2. Possibly, because it depends on how the schedule's worked out. If I have time, one more will come before it, but either way, it will be a remastered and updated version of my documentary to the disappearance of the SS Waratah. I think that video could be improved, and with the anniversary of her disappearance approaching, it's the perfect time. I've refined the script, added some details that I left out of the original, and have overall improved it. But along with the Waratah remaster, 
We're gonna keep these mysteries coming. I've decided to delay the Hedean Eon video for now, probably till August. You all like the mysteries, so I want to give you plenty to enjoy throughout this month first, and then it'll be time to finally cover the formation of the planet where all these mysteries take place. Can't wait to share that story with you all, and more to come, and I hope to see you all there. As for the next video, not the Waratah, the next original, I think you're going to really enjoy that one. I've got a fun topic and fun mysteries to cover, and it's something I've not done before. But for now, I'll leave you in suspense as to what it could be. Again, real life schedules will determine which of these two projects comes first. So until then, have a good one, everyone. Thank you for watching.